So we've looked at the life cycle of stars and we've looked at how they die. Yep. And in some sense, this is very close and personal because this explains where a lot of the atoms in our body come from. Yeah, and I think this is kind of the exciting and amazing thing when you talk about the life cycle of a star. It is really relevant to us. It's relevant to the floor, it's relevant to the air, it's relevant to us. All of these things are quite relevant to how the universe essentially came to be. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about with the sun's energy source, all that complicated stuff yeah. about nuclear fusion and so on. That's you know, where our energy comes from. And this is also where the atoms in our body came from. Now, this is the periodic table as seen by astronomers. <laughs> Don't laugh too much. <laughs> but uh, it's very accurate. This is the funny thing. So th the difference is that hydrogen and helium were produced between one and three minutes after the Big Bang, when the yep. whole universe was a giant nuclear reaction. And everything else has had to be produced in a star at some point. That's right. It, it is, we're we're going to talk about the different stars that may have been involved at the different stages. But you're right. Hi hydrogen and helium are these pristine elements we talk about and sometimes talk about them being pristine, created after those first few mo minutes after the Big Bang. So a human is, is primarily made of four elements, uh, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, yep. tron. The hydrogen will have come from the Big Bang, though a lot of it will have been through a star, but the carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen and also the calcium in our teeth, our bones, yeah. and all the other elements, the iron makes our blood cells red. These have all got to be through a star at some point. So, and, and the, it's this processing in the star that explains this pattern that we've seen numerous times before. That's though. right, we've, we've seen this a lot and we've seen there's different ratios and we see obviously there's a lot of hydrogen in there, but we also see that all of these elements are still present at some level. Yeah. So presumably just after the Big Bang, there would have been hydrogen, helium, and nothing else. So, the so you're saying essentially the first stars were pretty much just hydrogen and helium? Yes. And then as time has gone on, all these others have risen up. Now, it's a log scale. They're still yeah. less, all add up to less than 1% of the hydrogen and helium. But as the universe gets older, they will slowly ramp up a bit. Um, but where do they come from? I mean, in our sun, that's producing yeah. only helium. It's not producing anything heavier than helium. That's right. And that helium is still not even getting to the surface of the sun, let alone out there. Exactly. So how do the elements that are produced in the middle of a star actually get out? Well, this depends on the type of star and the time of the star. Now, as we talked about, different stars, depending on their sizes, sun, something larger, 8 to 10 times the mass of our sun, even something bigger than that, 30, 40, 50 times the mass of our sun, go through those stages quicker or at different paces and they go through different stages and these different stages end up being the key to when these elements are starting to come out. Now some of the elements make it out while they're a red giant star. Yep. So when our sun gets to the red giant phase, um, you've got a core of your carbon and oxygen and then various shells around it. But as it goes through these pulsations, sometimes that can mix stuff up yep. it and bring it up. some of this carbon out. And in fact, a lot of the carbon in our body has come from stars yep. like our own sun, only ones that formed earlier and have now died long since. And this, these pulsations in their dying days, stirring up some of this carbon oxygen in the middle. So that produces some of the new carbon oxygen type things, but not the heavier elements. That's right. We're not talking, we're not having gone to the iron. We haven't gone to the calcium. We haven't gotten to even the more exotic things there. So yes. we need another process to help us in this. Yep. And a white dwarf's just carbon, oxygen, it's not going to do anything. But how about if two white dwarfs merge and explode? Well, so this is the exciting thing, right? You have a carbon oxygen white dwarf with some mass, a carbon oxygen white dwarf, sometimes even adding a little neon just for fun, you know, just to spice it up, you know, if it's a little bit bigger. And as we've talked about, if they're close enough in a binary pair, they're still orbiting, they're still going around each other. But now through their late stages of evolution, they're starting to spiral closer to closer and closer and closer. Actually emitting gravity waves exactly. to cause them to get That's closer. The, and then eventually they become one. And when they become one, they explode. And this is a thermonuclear supernova That's we talked right. to last time. And that fuses heavier elements, right? Right, because now you have a whole bunch of extra energy from this explosion to be able to cr give this injection, essentially, to fuse these heavier elements. Okay, so we've got one source of heavy elements, but not very heavy elements, only things like carbon oxygen, which is um, medium mass stars when they're in their pulsing phase. Yep. Um, you've got another source which can produce much heavier elements, which is when two white dwarfs explode as a thermonuclear supernova. Yep. Uh, but the more massive stars, um, a more massive star, even while it's before it's turned into a supernova, is producing heavier elements in the middle. Can they ever get out? Well, they can when that star explodes, especially, right? And these stars, depending on their ages, 
can produce it at different levels. Now, it also depends on also how big it is, yeah. right? Does it explode or does it not? And in fact, there's a bit of a problem here because maybe in their pulsing phase, yes. some of the elements can get dredged up and get out. But actually, the heavy elements it's producing in the middle are destroyed. Yes. Because when it shrinks down, they get photo dissociated. The heat becomes so high that they all get rendered down to neutrons again. So it's a so, pain. We're trying to produce these heavy elements. Please produce these so heavy the elements. So the heavier elements kind of get dumped. But we still get some other stuff. It's not, it's not for no game. But then this explosion some produces things. some more heavy That's elements right. in a rather complicated procedure. How about the really massive stars? Are they going to produce heavy elements? or this? Well, we just said earlier that these heavy stars, they live, essentially live fast and die young, right? They go through their fuel quite quickly. They can't sustain it. They start to collapse down. And now even the electrons can't prop it up. So now you're squeezing the neutrons. Now even the neutrons can't support this up. And so they squeeze into a singularity where only the gravitational force is doing it. So the really massive ones are not going to be a useful source of heavy elements. They just go and turn into a black hole, taking all the heavy, beautiful heavy elements with them. They're, they're kind of a waste in some respect. But there's another recent discovery, yes. which is these neutron stars. Um, if it's a single neutron star, it's just going to sit there blipping away forever. Just like but a single white dwarf kind of sits there doing nothing. But if you had a binary neutron star, what's going to happen then? Well, and as we've talked about multiple times, most of the stars are binary. And there's no reason you couldn't get two eight times the mass of our sun, or maybe one's eight and one's ten. They're going to be rare, because these stars are rare, but yep. actually massive stars tend to have massive companions. That's right. So that's an interesting effect. So they tend to have mass companions. They both will go through these stages. So they both will expand, become potentially a super red giant for a while. They will both explode, producing their own supernova and taking some of their heavy elements with them, producing a little bit. And then they're left with neutrons. But now you're just left with two neutron stars. They're still in a pair. This pair doesn't miraculously go away. They're still, if they're close enough, some energy, and that energy starts to pull them towards each other. And they spiral and spiral and spiral and spiral and spiral till they produce some gravitational waves, as you mentioned with white dwarfs. But they can also collide like white dwarfs. And produce another explosion? They can produce another explosion, what we call a kilonova. So it's actually less powerful than a supernova, but more powerful than a nova. That's it's right. It's the naming scheme. And it kind of makes sense. There's not as much mass. There's not as much energy. The, the processes that is actually creating this explosion are weaker. So OK, the explosion's weaker. Except you're blowing up a neutron star. And this is what makes it special. You now have lots of neutrons that normally don't escape but now have the ability to run free across the universe. And that produces different elements and different isotopes. Right? Yes. So the first of these have just recently, in the last few years, been discovered with the gravity wave detectors. So there's a lot of excitement about it at the moment. Yes. So you've got a, this actually, you're getting three big explosions. I mean, you get a binary yep. with two master stars, each of which goes supernova producing a neutron star, and then the neutron stars merge and give you a kilonova. That's right, you get, it's three for the price of two. It's I wouldn't a want to be a planet around one of these. <laughs> no, that's right. Look, if you're living near here, it's a bad, it's a bad uh, 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 lifespan. However, for the rest of the universe, it ends up being very helpful. And so you can come up with a new version of the astronomer's periodic table, which various people have done after huge amounts of work, to work out where every element comes from. And different elements are produced by different processes. So for example, hydrogen and helium comes from the Big Bang. Yep. But then look at carbon. It's mostly yellow here, which means mostly it comes from dying low mass stars. This is the dredge up of the, when the red giant phase of a star like our own sun. So yes, yeah, so, so when we're saying low mass, we mean things sunish. Yep, but some of it, maybe a quarter or something, is coming from exploding massive, massive stars. stars. So that's right, and these really big stars in their explosion, because they have these shells, these shells can be mixed up and escape, and we physically see these measurements escaping out into space. And then you can see there's, the, for a lot of these elements along here, you've got a mixture, for example, for iron, some comes from exploding massive stars, and most comes from exploding white dwarfs. And that's kind of not surprising, right? We know what is the material's in there. We know it's on the inside. Again, it's all about those layers that have been produced that can now escape. And so, as you said, you get some mix, mixtures. Argon, again, has a good mixture of some big stars and some white stars. But again, it's from the explosion, right? It's from the process where you have now a lot of extra energy that can create a lot of extra fusion. And when you get down to the exotic higher elements, because these elements, you can't produce them from yep. here by gaining energy. That's right. You have to lose energy in the process. So they're only going to ex happen when there's a big explosion, which is putting energy in from somewhere else. So these mostly come from merging neutron stars, these kilonovas we've been talking about. And this is one of the exciting things that these kilonova, these two merging neutron stars, again, as you said, we've only known about this for a few years now, mm -hmm. has really started to show that 
because you have these neutrons that with a lot of energy, they can now create and fuse or create uh, these new elements previously that were inaccessible from the other physical mechanisms. Now, we should say small, low mass stars can produce some of these, but the problem we've always had is we can count from measurements like the sun. How much of this stuff do we have on Earth and how much would we need to produce it in these low mass stars? And the math never just worked out. If you look at uranium, for example, and that's come from the kilonovas, the, merge, uh, the very heavy element. Yeah. So that must, um, so the, the uranium is what in the core of the Earth keeps the middle, middle of the yeah. Earth molten and mucked up Kelvin's age estimate for the Earth. And it's what allows us to build nuclear reactors and atom bombs today. And that's all come from a kilonova, which is two medium mass stars, both of which explode to form supernova, producing neutron stars, which then merge in a kilonova. And I, and I think that's the amazing thing when you actually trace back the history of how this element had to be created and the life cycle and everything that's had to happen and for it to go through for that whole process we've talked about of their evolution to end up as an explosion that we can use here on earth. Uh, Paul though I have a quick question there's technetium uh, and don't know what PM is. I don't know what PM is sorry we're not uh, experts here why are these gray? I don't know do you know why they're gray? Well this ends up being the interesting question they're gray because we don't know Yes. And this is the point, is even though we know these elements exist, we know the isotopes, we know the nuclear reactions, we know the physical processes that drive these here on Earth, they have to come from somewhere. They don't just appear out of nowhere. Yes. So this is still... I mean, I've looked at different versions of this table produced by different people over the last 20 years or so, and it keeps changing. It does. The broad picture is probably fairly clear, yep. especially with the discovery of the merging neutron yes. stars. That's made a lot of things down here much clearer, but there are still some elements we have no idea where they come from. And then that means either we haven't observed enough of these, and that could be true. We haven't observed that many colliding neutron stars. I think we're at two. <laughs> That's not many, and you know, hopefully we'll get more. We've observed lots of exploding stars, so we're, we're pretty confident we haven't missed things there. We know a lot about dying small stars, so we probably haven't missed that many things there. It's possible, I don't know. So the, could there be another mechanism? Could it be a neutron star? We don't know. We don't know.